Well, Carrie Bauman and Alex Schadenberg join us now. Carrie is a clinical bioethicist for a hospital advising on end of life issues. He also serves at the Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto. And Alex is the director of the Euthanasia Prevention Council. Please welcome them both to Context. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you. Good great. To see you Alex, great to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, as a bioethicist, Carrie, uh, what questions does it raise when we come across this discovery that 20% of patients in a vegetative state may be exactly as Scout Rotley, completely mm -hmm. able to respond to questions they're being asked? Really raises some very deep ethical questions. <clears throat> One, you know, we're, we're often assuming with patients in vegetative states that they can't understand, they can't appreciate, therefore we go past them to make decisions, to families, to medical yeah. people. And so, you know, it then raises the question that even a small, if a small percentage of people can in fact understand and appreciate, there's really an ethical and legal obligation. Um, and again, the technology is not there yet, and I, I do understand these are early days, but there will be. I think, an obligation to try and reach in and to connect with the person in there to see what choice they would want to make. But if I personalize this, yes, the technology isn't there, and mm -hmm. even Scott's family can't access the technology whenever they want no. to, but now all of us have questions about mm -hmm. loved ones that we may be caring for. It yeah, and these questions are already emerging because, you know, the reality is, and I think you know this and so do the viewers, end-of-life decisions related to people in vegetative states are made all the time throughout this country and throughout the, most of the Western world. So, and I'm not saying we've got it wrong, and I'm not saying we have to stop everything we're doing, but we do have to explore, do we really, are we really certain that, in fact, this person is unable to participate in this decision or doesn't know what's going on. And you know, the technology may not be readily available yet, but it looks like the day is coming, I would imagine, fairly soon. Alex, you, uh, this is your specialty. How will this research affect end of life debates? Well, many people would look at the issue around PVS or people in a cognitive disability and they might say that that person's life is not worth living or they might ask questions like that. And so they're making judgment calls, but now, uh, there's an ability to say, well, what do we really know actually about this person? That's the first question. Are we certain? The second thing goes further is, uh, are we right always to simply withdraw treatment and care, or should these people somehow, uh, do, are they able to be rehabilitated? Are, are we looking at them at a lower common denominator than we should be? Uh, the fact is, is uh, many of these people, their lives are not only worth living, they're happy to be this way, and, uh, and, and that should be encouraged. Dr. Brian Young, who was um, the physician with the patient that was discovered to have the, the brain activity, he was quoted as saying, it would be nice to know if there are abandoned people out there who really are aware, who would benefit from stimulation. We probably owe it to people, is what Dr. Young said. And I would agree. And I would say to the people out there, you know, they're likely, perhaps in long-term care facilities, with staff that are doing the best they can. But let's be honest, we as a society don't invest a lot of money in those kind of facilities for long-term care. And, you know, uh, people may in fact need, need more interaction and a lot more assistance. So we face an ethical dilemma here because mm -hmm. this is about resources. This is about uh, people feeling they can play God with mm -hmm. the end of life. Mm -hmm. How are we going to know what to do? What's the moral compass? Well, the, the, the resources, I mean, let, let's be honest. If, if even, let's say, one out of 100 cases of persistent vegetative state, in fact, we reach in and the person says, I'm OK to live like this, society will have to assess what we will do in terms of resource allocation. But that's at the Supreme Court right now, the Rizzuli mm -hmm. case. Here's mm -hmm. a family. Alex, this, this seems to be that uh, doctors up to this point have said, no, we will be the ones that decide. Right, because the Rizzuli starts. case is really about that question, who has the right to decide to withdraw medical treatment? So this is, this is a life and death question in the case of Mr. Rizzuli, who's dependent on a ventilator. But he was supposedly PVS, and now they say he's not in a persistent vegetative state. He actually has some cognitive awareness. And it's important to look at this. Well, what is this level of care that we owe to the person? But yeah. the further to this, some people would say, as I say, go back to it. There is no, that, that life is not worth living. And some people make judgment calls that maybe this is too expensive and we should end that life because really there's nothing really there anyway. But, 
But is that is that right? Are we making our own judgment against someone's life? You know, just in our studio audience, as we were uh, getting you ready on set, you know, one of one of you shared your story with us that this had hit their family just you know last month, and you, you have the Supreme Court. The medical consensus seems to be operating on kill the pain, not kill the patient. But too many people have experiences that it actually seems to be kill the patient. What is changing in our culture that we have that increasing call for euthanizing people, Carrie? Well, you know, death has become a very complicated, negotiated mm -hmm. event. And nowhere earlier in our history, I mean, our history as, as human beings, have we negotiated the parameters of death the way we are now. We're in new terrain on all levels. Um, even religiously, I would say, we're in new terrain. I'm not saying religions have fo always focused on the meaning of death, but the negotiation over when do we stop, how do we stop, what constitutes, what doesn't. I, I would think we're actually in new terrain, even for a lot of religious scholars. And we're somewhat baffled by this as a society. You know, we have people that fear over-treatment. Don't keep me attached to those machines. I can't think of anything worse. And we have people that fear under-treatment. Don't take my mother off too quickly because I, you know, the disability is not a problem. So we're really struggling as a society with these kinds of issues, the negotiation of end-of-life decisions. But I, I, I actually think, you know, that this research, as we speak about functional MRI and, and, and have the capacity to hopefully look into to people and see if the person can interact, I actually think it may be a blessing. I think it may really help us to make good and ethical decisions. And Alex, your closing thoughts on how we should make those good and ethical decisions? Well, I think that we all become vulnerable when we're looking at these situations. When we're looking at this, how does this affect us personally? I'm very concerned about people when they get into a very vulnerable state. And so when they are, you know, these decisions being made about end of life treatment and care, should we end the treatment, should we end their life? It's about a person who is in, in a very difficult position. I'm very concerned about people with disabilities and others, but those in a very vulnerable position is this really going to be about their choice sometimes? And I don't think so, really, and in the end. And the track record from other nations where it has, where euthanasia steps have been legalized, it's not good. It's not good in the Netherlands and Belgium, that's for sure. All right. Thank you both for tackling such a complex issue with us. And um, there's more on our website about these things, but thank you very much both. Now it's time to find out what you think. Would you pull the plug on someone if you knew it was their wish? Yes or no? Send us your answers by phone, email, Facebook, or Twitter. Be part of the conversation. We'll let you know how the studio audience voted on that after this. Coming up, one family's experience with suffering and disability that shaped their views of dying with dignity.